now we can officially start and I can see a few more countries appearing in the chat. So this is great. Keep introducing yourselves. We are super excited to have so many of you with us on this webinar series. And so if you've never been to one of our webinars before, uh, we are Conservation Optimism. We're an organization that empowers everyone to act for nature. Uh, we want to shift the narrative away from the doom and gloom, and we do a lot of outreach and science communication and this type of things. Um, and so we have a network of organizations that uh, pledge to be more optimistic in the way they're framing nature and conservation messages. So if you're part of an organization and you're not yet a member, uh, you can go on our website, we'll put a link, there's an online form you can fill, and once your organization is a member, you can be a, a webinar speaker, you get to uh, attend uh, exclusive workshops, we have a mentoring program as well, so you get access to all this exciting content and you get to meet lots of other people, um, because at the moment we are, I think, on over 150 organizations from all around the globe, so it's a, it's a, it's a nice network and it's nice to be in touch with lots of different people. But Enough about the network. Today, we are super excited to have this webinar around conservation photography, how to use visual to tell conservation stories. And so I will pass on now to uh, Anthony, who is with us today from Tony Wild, and he is going to tell us all about conservation photography and how to use the power of images. So I'll, uh, I'll pass it on to you, and you should now be able to get, ah, you should now be able to share your screen. Uh, thank you, Julia. Uh, I'm really excited and humbled to, to be here. Happy Wildlife, Wild Wildlife Day, everyone, uh, where you are, and I'm pretty sure you guys are doing amazing work. Um, I'm just going to share my screen, and then uh, we, we can start from there. Uh, but kindly feel free to ask as many questions as possible uh, in, in as we continue, because this will more, be more of a discussion rather than just uh, uh, me telling you how much I love wildlife. And, and photography. Uh, I'm just gonna start straight. Good, I hope everyone can hear me. You can just let me know from, uh, uh, you can either wave or just let me know you. Uh, so I can be able to know if you're hearing me. My name is Anton Cheng Onyango. I am from Kenya and uh, I'm a combination of a lot of things. Uh, but I try as much as possible and go with, uh, with the following aspects. Uh, I'm a wildlife ecologist by training. Uh, I'm an educator, a conservation photographer and filmmaker, and I'm a member to uh, International League of Conservation Photographers. Uh, and uh, I run a platform called Tony Wild. So Tony Wild is a platform that uses uh, visuals to educate people about conservation uh, and basically use both photography and film. Uh, in both particular uh, spaces. So Tony Wild was founded in 2017 and how it actually happened is because I felt there's a disconnect between uh, uh, myself and uh, my people at home. Uh, and I'm basically talking about my parents, my siblings. Uh, all they'll see is that I was working for a conservation organization, but they don't understand why exactly am I doing this particular work. But then that is when I realized there's a gap between, between uh, uh, scientists and, uh, and, uh, and our own communities in the sense that we need to really, really break down uh, the, the communication of the importance of wildlife conservation to each and every person. Um, my belief is that wildlife conservation is not for an individual, it's a responsibility for all of us. And I felt we need to share this information wide and as fast as possible to be able to inspire a generation that comes uh, next and even the current generation. So how we are structured, how the model works for Tony Wild is that we, we, we begin with the science because uh, we need all, we, we as scientists or, or every scientist have these amazing conservation papers, but these papers have to be simplified for us humans to understand. And when I talk about humans, it's everyone, whether you are working in business sector, whether you're working in uh, development, whether you're, doing, uh, whether you're doing teaching or any other aspect of any career, but you need to be able to understand the science from the conservation space. But as much as you need to understand why it is important to understand the science, there are these contemporary issues that happen every single day. Right now we talk about climate change, 
we are talking about recovery of species uh, that are actually going to extinct. Uh, we need to communicate these issues. There are some that are urgent. There are some that are not really that urgent, but they need to be told. And how you're going to tell them, we need different ways to communicate. So the whole idea is how do we really package information so that each and every person has the privilege to access that information. Conservation for a very long time has been locked and uh, to a few or a specific group of people. And uh, in the real sense, conservation is a role for each and every person. Uh, whether you're coming from an ecosystem that is uh, a wetland, a forest ecosystem, a lake ecosystem, a marine ecosystem, all everyone living in that ecosystem needs to understand the importance of conservation. And for them to be able to support conservation efforts, they have to understand it. And that is the basis we operate on. So basically, Tony Wild has two particular platforms, you have the production and production end, and you have the program end. So the program end is actually our impact end. And I'll show you guys how exactly we, we, uh, we do it, but also give you ideas on how you can actually do uh, uh, use photography within your own institutions and organizations uh, to be able to inspire more and more other people. Uh, so in the programs we have, uh, uh, we have uh, the visual uh, campaign, wildlife campaign, we have the visual ecological literacy program and the mitigation project. All these are programs that are built into Tony Wild platform and are fully funded by uh, the assignments that I do uh, within the conservation space. And the reason why I use this particular platform is because I needed my images to be used somewhere. I needed my images to inspire the next generation. So for example, the Visual Ecological Literacy Program, we go to a school and apart from just showing the kids the amazing images, we go an extra mile to actually train the kids how to use the camera and take them for a game drive. And within that particular game drive, they're able to create images for themselves so they can put an image of wildlife on their name. Uh, and, and if you look at wildlife photography for a very long time, it has not been done by the locals uh, or it's not been done by, by Africans itself. It's, it's been uh, many our, our main visitors coming to the country. But then the impact of having an African create that particular image and educate other young people on the same, it brings that power of understanding that conservation issues really, really are important and they don't belong to a specific space. It's everyone's need to be able to conserve uh, environmental conservation. So the production side is we, we run from conservation photography, filming, and currently getting into animation and illustrations. So we have a team behind this that works on these particular aspects and to be able just to build in and increase the reach uh, in terms of creating awareness um, and education uh, across board. So I'll just give you a couple of examples on how I started. I love birds, and birds are, are one of my entry points when you talk about conservation issues. But not every bird uh, is able to be seen uh, without the binoculars or, or either you're close to it. So when I started off, I said taking pictures of birds because birds are fast, they're everywhere. Uh, and birds are indication, indication, indicators of different ecosystem health. So you can find some on wetlands, you can find some in forests, you can find some in uh, in marine, but you never find them, all of them are at in one particular ecosystem. So for one to learn about ecosystem conservation, for me, I felt birds was an entry point. And one of the major questions I actually put forward in my presentation is, imagine one day you get to a point where there are no birds, like you don't, don't hear any birds. Uh, it, 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 it can be worrying because it means that there's, there's, some, there's some imbalance within that particular uh, food web or, or, or food chain. And, uh, and when I started creating images of birds, people started now getting a closer interaction on what is the name of the bird, where is it located, what exactly is it, what exactly is it doing, like the action in the bird. So the close-ups of the birds really played a key role. But 
I didn't just end up on creating images of uh, nice portraits of the birds, but I went ahead to even interact with scientists who are actually working with the birds, either ringing them, uh, either doing research on them to be able to document what they are doing so that you can ease the communication of that scientific paper to have everyone understand through the images and a few texts to be able to take action towards conservation issues. And uh, as I said before, I'm, I'm, I'm an ecologist too. So when I spend time with scientists, I am a scientist at the end of the day and I have to help in either ringing or collecting data or analyzing the data itself, just having discussion of the same. But, but back in my mind, my role is how exactly can I create images that can make someone take action? And that action can either be to support conservation or to able to educate an, another group of people uh, on the importance of conservation issues. Uh, so this is just an example of, uh, of one of the posts uh, on, uh, on my social media handle is, uh, and this is back in 2017. And it's very amazing that within that, that particular part, this is when I was just starting off. Uh, and, and when I was sharing these particular images, people who at home in my own village were actually indicating the name of the bird in local language. And, and this was something that for me, it's amazing to see that we understand our birds. We understand them even in the local languages. We just need some enhancement in understanding why they're important. And I felt these images play a very key role, uh, play a key important role in conservation. And, and when, when you create amazing images of portraits, it just draws people into wanting to know what exactly is going on and how to build them up. And that's how I created the, the Traveling for Birds project. So in that particular process, I created a project that now uh, just talks about birds in different ecosystems and uh, educating kids about conservation issues. So it's not just about taking pictures. It's about using those images to create an impact and to create change and to actually make people question their action and be able to push to support conservation. Uh, continuously. People, for me, people are a center for conservation issues. And uh, when I'm doing my conservation photography stories, I respect the people who support conservation because they're very resilient, they're passionate. They actually have forgone a lot of things to be able to do uh, the work they do. And I give them high respect because without them or without the scientists, without the rangers, without uh, the, the individuals do admin in conservation organizations, uh, they create that key role. And they all have stories and why they are there. And if you don't tell those stories, either through photography or through film, you can't be able to inspire the next generation. Uh, because for a very long time, uh, conservation is always treated as a side, as a side career, a career that does not pay. We won't reach out to the levels I want to get to, but Let's go beyond the money. Let's think about our careers in how we support conservation efforts. And that is the reason why I create those particular images. So if you're working for an organization and you need to create images, try as much as possible and create images that will be used to influence either decision within policy, uh, influence people's actions and behavior, and be able to stand out uh, to inspire the next generation. So just go through a couple of images uh, for this particular project that I did uh, in partnership with the uh, Game Rangers Association of Africa. And when I was spending time with the rangers, there's more to them, there's family, there's mother, their mothers, their, their fathers, uh, they have their families, they, they have fun in that particular process. Uh, they don't just carry guns around as, as, as most of the images might portray, which is important because of depending on the, on the, on the context as which the images have been created, but creating those passionate images that will connect people. Uh, people who are not necessarily, necessarily living next to wildlife areas is, is a powerful uh, way to actually communicate about conservation issues. And, and going to the extent of 
not just showing the beautiful animals, but stepping into and sharing the threats that wildlife faces. So don't be afraid to take that image of a horrible scene. If you have, if you are ethical and you're doing it in the right space and you caption it correctly, please share it out there because you might be the person creating the next change that is needed in society through that one particular image. So we're in a stage where we have technology, we have your phones. Please don't, don't be afraid to communicate and inspire a generation to do the right thing uh, continuously. And, and for me, it's just the power of images that go around. Uh, and this is one of my favorite images of, uh, of Thomas. Thomas is an arranger for the Bongo Surveillance Project. And we were looking for the bongos for almost, I think, a week, and we couldn't find them. But luckily enough, they had put camera traps so that we can able to identify where they were and in the numbers they are. And when, when Thomas was going through the images on the camera, and I was just sitting next to, actually across to him, he was like, just see, here's the bongo, we've just found one. Uh, and, and, and just creating, just seeing him smile of him finding the bongo, uh, but seeing an image of it was really, really touching for me because it means that they're not just using these cameras uh, for, for, for just taking pictures of bongo, but they're able to now use that data an extra mile to be able to inform that that particular forest has bongo and needs to be conserved. Uh, and, and this is the role that rangers play. This is the role that the images play. If we don't tell these stories, and nobody will be able to take concern about conservation issues. So we always need to be able to stretch ourselves further and tell these particular stories. Uh, everyone loves, I'm pretty sure everyone loves dogs and cats, but these are, if you're coming, if you're in Kenya uh, and you're coming from a pastoral community, or any other community that keeps livestock, you always notice that they have dogs. But if you're in a wildlife conservation area, dogs and cheetahs and wild dogs, they share common, uh, common uh, diseases. So for, for organizations to be able to, to reduce this uh, uh, spread of rabies uh, across the ecosystem, they have to be able to vaccinate the dogs. And you have to be able to tell that using pictures and using visuals. And this is just a couple of images uh, that I took on, on an assignment for Action for Cheetahs Kenya in Samburu in uh, 2018. And uh, you'll see the love, of, it's not just about the wildlife story, it's about the people and how they live and how they, they take their time to be able to just live close by to wildlife. Uh, so I know, you. You may be looking forward to those amazing, nice elephant shots, but then that's, that's not my role. My role is to ensure that each and every person understands what happens in the conservation space and how they can actually be able to support them. So if you're a scientist and you're listening to this, look for another creative person within your space, work together with, with him or her and create images that can help you in your research paper, uh, that can help you in creating awareness on, what, on the research you're doing and those images can be used again to push for policy and action uh, in one or another. And for me, people, pe people are the core center of conservation. And if people don't understand the reason why wildlife is important, nobody will care about them. And we have to do everything we can to ensure that each and every person understands that conservation is key. And I talk about people here, I don't talk about any particular particular space of people. I talk about each and every person. Conservation is a privilege for each and every person because we depend on it in every particular aspects of our lives. Uh, and, and just a couple of them. So the more you keep doing these assignments, the more you realize that uh, there's, there's so much to be told and I can't tell it by myself. But we need as many photographers uh, to be able to get out there and, and tell these amazing images. Uh, we have amazing conservation organizations doing a lot of amazing work, but then we need those images. And just to give you a backstory on how it actually happened is that I used to work for uh, Bird Life International 
and uh, we were giving grants uh, in, the, in the 15 African countries. And one of the key things I used to ask uh, the grantees is I need images, but the images were not appealing enough to be able to support uh, even to do a social media post to promote their work. And I felt that was where the gap is. So each and every CSO conservation organization, small or big, needs images to be able to uh, to be able to promote their work, attract funding, and be able to inspire the next generation. And 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 the more you you keep doing activities uh, that that need critical attention, some people do not have time to read the whole scientific paper. But just through the images, they came able to know, yes, this is a roadkill. It's a striper hyena. Uh, it's rarely seen. Uh, just facts. But then in one image, you can able to push for policies in the sense that if you indicate where this particular road was and where the hyena was knocked, it does not mean that it's only the hyena being knocked. There are the other wilder species that are being knocked across board. And for, for us to get our politicians and the policies and the people to understand that we need to drive safely, we need to have uh, proper demarcated uh, areas where wildlife can cross, you need images to create uh, that particular sense. So basically that's, that's, that's my uh, what I do. And, and uh, I wanted to just show you a case study of uh, of a film that I've been working on for about three three years, but it all started as a, as a conservation a photography assignment. Uh, and it's all about chimps and forests and people. Uh, and I don't know if, uh, I'm just gonna go up to the top um, and then I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. So if there's any question, please, please feel free to drop them there. And then, then I'll ask uh, Iona to see if she can share uh, the the film and I, I know you guys have, have seen the film uh, and the reason why uh, the film is important to me is because we are in the current decade of restoration but then what people are actually doing right now is just they're planting trees people are not actually growing trees and that's a problem uh, and that is the biggest problem people are just planting as many trees as possible but then we need to grow trees Sezi is 63 years old. He planted his first tree at 11 years. He's been able to plant up to 391 hectares of forest and is now home for chimpanzees. And when I met him two years, I felt bad nobody knew about him. And the best way to tell his story to be able to inspire the next generation is to be able to document it. Uh, the first time I met Sezi, I could not even take an image because I was drowned in the passion that he had about the forest. I've gone to a wildlife uh, a forest class, but I couldn't, I couldn't articulate the importance, the trees, the scientific names, and the uses how Sezi will do it. And apart from that, Sezi is now, he's retired, but he's still taking his time to train other young people to be able to grow trees. So this film will be out uh, running uh, in the month, in this particular month moving forward. And for me, it's just to push for people to go beyond just planting trees. Uh, and, and that is the reason why it's important to create uh, content that be able to have an impact at the end of the day. Um, yeah, so that's it. So you guys feel free to let me know if you have any questions and I'll be able to uh, uh, try as much as possible and answer, answer your questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tony. That was such an amazing and inspirational talk. And those images are just beautiful. So yeah, um, feel free to ask questions in the chat or raise your hand. We have one who's about to ask a question in, um, right now. Um, but yeah, but please feel free to just put them in the chat. I can read them out or you can say them out loud. So I see Nina, you've just raised your hand. So um, feel free to go ahead. Thanks, Iona. Um, and thanks so much, Tony. That was um, really lovely. And I think it's in the chat. I don't know if you can see the chat, but everyone has been saying how amazing your photos are. Um, and I just wanted to second that because it was such a pleasure. Um, in, it's something that I work in a comms team um, in, for a wildlife charity. And 
much as our partners are doing fantastic work, a lot of the time we don't have images that tell the story and are not um, as, as good as the work is, you know, the, for, like for various reasons, including equipment, training, et cetera. Um, and uh, your, your photo is absolutely stunning. I was so jealous. <laughs> I was just watching them being like, I wish I had images like that in my image library. Um, but I, so, you know, we work with all these partners and one of the things that um, we're doing at the moment is, is trying to kind of encourage people to take better images because a lot of people now do have smartphones even in the field. So they have better equipment than they have done before. Um, what would you say, do you have any tips for uh, what we could say to those partners or for people who are on this call who are working in the field to try and get images? You know, they, they don't have DSLRs and the best equipment, but the things to focus on when they're thinking about taking images when they're in the field. Just going to wait a moment, there's some risk around my place, but... Once it's gone, I'll be able to answer your question, Nina. Thank you. But in the, uh, can you hear me now? I think it's better. Yeah. Okay. So Nina, yes. Uh, I, I would love, I would love as much as possible for the partners to be able to create those images. Uh, uh, and and the simple way I can just tell them is be able when your photography is all about two things: uh, lighting and composition. And, and in terms of lighting, just allow us to see what you're going to see. And, and in terms of composition, composition, it, it has to tell a story. Uh, if you're going to show us somebody planting a tree, show us plant, somebody planting a tree. If you're going to show us the equipment uh, that are being used by the veterinary doctors to, uh, uh, to treat a rhino or a giraffe, show us those equipment. You have to show us the people who are working in conservation, show us those equipment. Uh, don't make so many things in one frame. Uh, and I'll talk about composition. Just make that frame a more interesting frame and with <laughs> as much as little information as possible, but be able to inspire uh, the next generation. And, and please feel free to reach out to other photographers because as much as, as, much as the partners are there, it's always good to, uh, for us to keep us going because this is our, our full-time job. This is what we, we depend on. And we really want to help uh, conservation organizations, especially those who don't have the capacity within themselves to be able to tell their stories uh, and to help them develop a library. Uh, and in addition, for, for me, it's the images, if I'm gonna work with an organization, is that the profits go to an education program that I run on the side. So it's a, it's a give and take for me. So it's always a, an in-kind support, but a collaboration sort of. So that is a kind of relationship you can create with, uh, with other photographers in the ecosystem. And, and, and please feel free. You can even reach out to me and I'm pretty sure there are other photographers in the space who will be happy to reach hear from you and you can able to help them out, uh, help you uh, document amazing images yeah, for your projects and your partners. Yeah. I hope I answer you well. That was excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nina. Um, we have a question in the chat. I'll just read that out. And I see that Claire and Kat have also raised their hands. So I'll just read out this question first because it builds on um, Nina's question. Hi, Anthony. You spoke about the need for images in the field and on projects. How important is hardware in capturing captivating images? Many of the people in the field aren't skilled photographers. So would you advise organizations to enlist specialist photographers regularly, understanding that this is often a cost that donors won't cover? Uh, yes, you. It's it's important. And 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 before I used to do monitoring and evaluation for conservation projects, and uh, I felt the need of looking for those images. And if you're talking about uh, donors and how to actually uh, talk to donors, it's images that actually make donors be able to as a verification tool. Uh, so if you look at if you look at the log frame, and if you look at uh, one of the means of verification, uh, you have to have images. And you can justify that on your budget and say, do you know what, uh, guys, I need a photographer or a filmmaker to be done this, this, and this, and this is what it cost, and that you can be able to justify your cost. I understand that conservation organizations need a lot of money to be able to run themselves and to be able to do the impact. But at the same time, look at them, look at this particular process as, a, as, a, as an investment for, the, for your next, uh, for your next, uh, for your next donor, for your next opportunity, for your next campaigns, to be able to 
not only create impact, but able to raise funds on the other end. So yes, I will advise as much as possible, as much as it is important to hire a communication person and a monitoring and evaluation person and an admin person, it's important to uh, uh, employ or have in your team a creative person who can be able to create for you images and films that can help you amplify their voice, your voice uh, in the conservation space, yeah. Thanks so much. Um, I'm gonna pass the mic to Claire, who's just raised her, their hand in the chat as well. I think she's um, muted. Are, are you there? I think she's muted. I, she's unmuted. I can see her lips moving, but somehow the sound is not coming out. So yeah, working now. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, so one, thank you so much for that talk. That was really inspiring. Um, one thing that you mentioned was um, about using these images to inspire the next generation. And I was wondering if you had any tips for um, how to communicate to children and um, more of a younger audience. Uh, what age bracket? <laughs> um, let's say age um, five to ten. Uh, so for five to ten, I'm pretty sure uh, art will be drawing art will be key for allowing them to actually be able to use the colors and, and, and pencils to go to draw art for for wildlife. That would be key. But even just having, uh, if you create images in the in the in in the field, I'm able to show them and they can able to draw them. It gives them the power of uh, that image being in their mind for a longer period. Uh, you can imagine a young kid holding uh, a nice crayon drawn image of a lion from a picture you've taken. That image stays, that memory stays for her or, or him for a very long time before it fades out. But that might be the first interaction he or she uh, is having in relation to wildlife conservation. So art plays a key important role uh, to be able to uh, build up uh, this particular space. Uh, we, we work with children uh, but then we try as much as possible and and make it as simpler for them to be able to consume. Uh, and for the young kids, we 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 try to just use images that they can easily spell out, like elf or lion, uh, and be able to relate with. Uh, for children around between nine to to fifteen, we can able to give them cameras. Some are even holding cameras for the first time, DSL cameras, and we to create those images. And that excitement of just holding a camera, that is just enough to spark a young person's uh, uh, a young person's imagination of what they can actually do. Uh, and and for me, when when I see that, it's the major core that tells them that you can be anything you want to be. But at the end of the day, the back the the back of your mind, you have to know. Environmental conservation is the backbone of anything that you do in your life, regardless of what career you take. So this is just an idea to just to spark them uh, and to get them in the space that conservation is not for a few individuals. It's not for the scientists. It's not for iconic uh, uh, people. It's it's our responsibility, and I'll keep pushing that as much as I can in any space that I find. Yeah. Thank you, Claire. I hope I answer you. Thank you. That was uh, actually a perfect answer. Thank you so much. Thank you, Claire. Awesome. Okay. Um, there's a couple more questions that have come in, so I just have to scroll up to find them again. Um, right. From jo I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name, Jana. Thanks for this inspiring presentation, Anthony. I much enjoyed it. I'm curious, what do you personally think is the biggest factor stopping people to take conservation action? Wow, uh, that will vary depending on, on different situations. <laughs> but the one I found more, find most is that people do not just know and or either they can know, but they don't just want to take action or they don't see the importance of it. And, and you see the definition of wildlife is not in protected areas. We stay with wildlife on a daily basis. People don't understand that wildlife is actually at our backyards, the birds, the, the lizards, the, the spiders, the snakes. We have them and they play a key role in that particular ecosystem. And for, for someone to be able to support conservation, they have to be able to not only know, 
but understand why it is important. So just to answer your question, I think the biggest factor is that people don't just know uh, that it's important. And it's really, really expensive. Education is expensive, let's just be honest. Uh, teaching people about conservation stuff is expensive. And, and, and it is costing, uh, without having environmental education in most of our, of our curriculums, is affecting us everywhere. And, and you'll find people in different spaces of careers not taking concern about wetlands, about water bodies, about uh, ecosystem restorations, about species. They'll make amazing decisions to assist the development of a nation. But if you don't take into consideration conservation of this particular uh, uh, spaces, you affect the whole ecosystem. And then conservation for a very long time has been pushed on on issues based, it's uh, forests, it's plastics, it's uh, it's species, it's and 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 if somebody is not interested in those particular platforms, they won't get involved. So I feel conservation needs to be broadened up. It should it should allow each and every person to be part of that conversation, and it should be accessible in the sense that an individual needs to understand that. As much as I am moving from point A to point B, I will interact with as many wildlife as possible, and I should be able to give them the respect they deserve and be able to live with them together with them. So that, that is the major issue. The major issue is how do we change, not really technically change, but that how do we how do we enhance the behavior of people to support conservation in a positive way? Yeah. And that that's that's the whole idea, and that's 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 my kind of uh, uh, language I'll, I'll push out there. Yeah. Thanks. That's an awesome answer. Um, there's another question. Are there any online resources that train our team to frame and take more powerful images? I can partly reply to this one. Last year, Tony ran a series of workshops with us, and um, they're all online on our Wild Hub page. If you are a member or even if you're not, feel free to email um, us. Um, I'll put the email in the chat and I can give you a link to those resources. But I'm wondering if you have any other suggestions, Tony? Oh, you're muted. Oh, no, sorry. I'm, 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 I'm in a kind of noisy place. I'm just going to wait. It passes oh, and then I can continue. Yeah. Uh, so there, there are quite amazing resources outside there. And uh, there are quite amazing other photographers. You can actually look at their work and get inspired. Uh, being a member of the International League of Conservation Photographers, which has over 50 photographers, when you go to that website, you can, you can just be inspired on, on seeing how uh, they do their work. And they also have different, uh, uh, they, have, they have ways they can share on, on how they can be able to create images. So YouTube is one resource that, that actually helps. Uh, such webinars will actually help uh, to, to, to be able to get those particular skill sets. Because there are some you will learn from YouTube, but there are some you just do practically. Uh, and, uh, and, and join the spaces, uh, join as many spaces as possible because with, with, with the more spaces you join, the more information you get to access to information that can support you in creating images. Yeah, I think that's the best way I can answer it. Thanks. Um, there's some comments that are just uh, visuals are a very big part of creating impact. Budgeting for visuals, photo or video is so important for organizations as it helps communicate effectively. Um, sorry, I'm just leading. Um, I have another another comment here. It's we have a society that is using photography as a medium to relay conservation messages targeting out of school youth and primary school students in and around wildlife protections in Botswana. We are much pleased with the results so far. The only hindrance so, so far is the lack of equipment as in cameras and I'm sure that's something that a lot of people can attest to. Um, but yeah, um, I do have a, a question here. Um, in a world where content is being consumed a lot on the daily, how do creators, photographers, filmmakers, writers, artists, etc., package conservation content in an engaging way that will make people care? There's often a myth that conservation is just for a select few and not everyone's job. Wow, that's those are two questions that are very heavy at the same time. <laughs> but let me just try and break it down. So. Um, uh, 
there is, there is, there is one of my fellows here who did a very nice film on uh, using animations, but drawing paper cuts uh, is, is among the audience. And it was hilarious. Like we need to make uh, wildlife films that can make someone laugh off and not only laugh, but in the day has a message to go home with. So that, that's other ways you can do it. Um, I know communicating science on TikTok and uh, Instagram, it's, it's kind of sometimes really difficult, but then I know we, we are creatives. You can think about different ways. You can go through art, you can go through, uh, you can use uh, sound. And interestingly, sound, sound is a powerful tool out there. Uh, we just completed the recent uh, new summit and we had composers uh, composed a soundtrack alongside uh, a documentary live on stage and that was that was mind blowing uh, if if you love music alone and not wildlife you definitely love the music plus the wildlife and that would definitely stand out so we just have to be creative in one another because things are changing uh, and then make them short uh, and that's why education programs are really really key so you start early with with the young generation with the older generation use influencers uh, try as much as possible and find influencers who can be able to communicate uh, the conservation aspect. And again, in the, in, the, in the aspect of the myth that conservation is selected few, uh, not everyone's job, it's, that myth has to disappear. It has to go. But then we have to be able, we as conservationists or scientists, we have to step out and be able to interact with other spaces to be able to inform them that Conservation is key, regardless of whatever space you do. And, and this myth has, has, it has happened for, for a very long period of time. And, 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 and you can't blame it. You, you can blame it on, on colonization. You can blame it on capitalism. You can blame it on anything you want to blame. But at the end of the day, we have to find a solution. We have to make sure everyone deserves a privilege to access natural resources in every place they are. And for them to be able to understand that it belongs to them, we have to be able to communicate. And communication can be, as using drums, I, I don't know how you figure out that, but you can be able to communicate that to as many people as possible. So I think that's the best way I can answer it, yeah. And we all, all that are here have a responsibility to play, yeah. Just pick your space, use your responsibility and be able to inspire the next generation to do the right thing. Let us forget about, not forget, but let us put the injustices that have been happening in the past but be able to embrace a society that supports conservation, people, and, and, and livelihoods, yeah. Awesome, thank you, <laughs> so inspirational. Um, I think we're gonna have one last question and then it will be probably at the hour. Um, so just uh, remember to make sure that you answer our post-webinar feedback survey, it's in the chat. Um, we'll be sending all the resources that we've spoken about today um, to you um after the webinar and this rep rec yeah, this webinar is recorded so that will be appearing on youtube hopefully early next week but in the meantime the last question how would you best describe the state of support for creative activism in conservation i ask as an interdisciplinary artist and it would seem the artistic end doesn't value conservation the conservation end doesn't understand how to leverage art with the exception of photography video or literature at individual practice levels what is your assessment in the state we're in? Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, I think this, these are the most difficult questions I'm getting this year. Okay, okay. So let, 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 me, let, let, me, let me try put my head into the space and see. Uh, for, for a very long time, art has not been considered as a career. And that is something that has really affected so many artists across the board. Uh, and. Uh, and yes, it's difficult to be able to use art for conservation in a different way. But the thing is, that, um, what I'm trying to say is that just try, try whatever you have, because someone somewhere will notice and someone somewhere will be able to hide and use it to be able to inspire the next generation of conservationists. And the next generation of people will care or be philanthropic about supporting nature. So if you are a musician, if you are a, if you are uh, if you're doing murals as art, if you're doing uh, there's so many there's so many art out there, and 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 with with me, I can imagine 
there's so much that you can do. Our paintings on, on, on our buildings with amazing wildlife art uh, across the board communicating about wildlife, it's, it's just amazing. So it's just you as an individual identify your art, talk to the scientists on board and, and be able to have that conversation with them. Be open enough to be able to listen to them. And as and I understand artists sometimes have, we have our own way of closing ourselves off, but I've learned over time that you need to be able to be vulnerable in that process and be able to learn from other scientists or other spaces and then come up with an idea and then share it to them. You know what, this is what I want to do. Do you think it aligns with your objectives? And if it aligns with your objectives, you're able to, to, she or he will be able to support that particular process. So there are different levels of understanding. The person uh, themselves and then uh, the other layer is what is the objective? Are you aligning yourself with the objective of what they're doing? Uh, it's just like applying for a job. If you're applying for a job, you need to make sure you're aligning yourself with the objective of that particular job. Uh, and as an artist, treat that as a job and approach it professionally in that particular process and be able to pitch or show your portfolio in the sense that this is my work, this is what I've done. And you can start by even volunteering for an organization for like three months, create for them amazing, uh, amazing art in terms of graphics. I, I know the amazing graphic design artists out there were just purely working for conservation, creating art or for graphics for conservation, but they have a portfolio. They build that portfolio, present yourself. If it's music, create music that makes me stop and think about my actions in the conservation space. I know making a conservation film is uh, music is not that easy. You have to be really, really right on your on your words and your lyrics. Uh, and I hope I can get to hear more conservation songs across the board. But yes, uh, it's it's a difficult take. But again, it's about again our personalities as individuals and how best can we work together to be able to uh, to be able to grow that. But I'm, I'm available to have that conversation on the side and, and be able to hear your thoughts uh, and just to see how best uh, we can able to, to find a space where art and activism can work together to really, really inspire change. Yeah. That was amazing. Um, I think I speak for everyone when we say thank you for this webinar. It was really inspirational and your images are insane. Thank um, you. I'm going to, we, we're at, we're, we've hit um, the hour now, so I'm going to end the call. As I said, the recording will be online. Feel free to check out Conservation Optimism. Feel free to check out Tony Wild website. There's all these resources online and I will be sending them out to everyone as well. But in the meantime, thank you very much um, for joining us. And just before so everyone goes, sorry, sorry, uh, I want to say a massive thank you to you, Tony, for this webinar. But also our next webinar will be by Women for Wildlife in April. And then we will have the Lowland Tapir Conservation talking to us in May. So all these info will be coming soon. So make sure to keep an eye on our social and website and we'll give you all the info. They're monthly, so we'll always have once every month uh, for most of the year. Yeah, thank you, Tony. And thanks for everyone for joining.